I would love to believe that when I die, I will live again. That some thinking, feeling, remembering part of me will continue. But as much as I want to believe that, and despite the ancient and worldwide cultural traditions that assert an afterlife, I know of nothing to suggest that this is more than wishful thinking. So said Carl Sagan. But what if there was something more? Something that we didn't yet know about? Well, that's the issue explored in tonight's two stories, both from Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up, so you could send your stories to me and I could read them all for you. So, my dear friends, what better time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. Once the audience had assembled, I brought up PowerPoint on the big screen and started my presentation. Hello, my name is Piora. Welcome to Damnation 101. No doubt many of you are wondering why you are in a lecture hall instead of enjoying clouds of sulfur while you have your eyes and genitals poked out with red-hot pitchforks. <laughs> well, every one of you has committed grievous mortal sins. None of you has to suffer if you make your full quota of souls. If you don't, they will kick you out of this comfy oasis. Would you like to be roasted in lava and tortured by the horrible monsters that live in it for eternity? No? Good. Pay close attention, and your afterlife can be full of devil's food cake, deviled eggs, and demon rum. <laughs> that joke always makes me smile. You have the opportunity to destroy your worst enemies. Did you ever tell someone to go to hell? Well, now you can really do it. I grinned. Hmm, isn't that wonderful? But your purpose here isn't fun and games. You are here because our work is absolutely critical. We are in a cold war with heaven. Soon it will heat up again. Our side needs all the soldiers we can get. Either destroy God and his angels, or every one of us will suffer eternal damnation. Now that you understand why you are here, let me tell you a story. I was a member of the original 84 legions of Lucifer. But I was a foot soldier, the lowest of the low. I worked hard and earned my promotions up the ranks. My last assignment was first assistant to the director in the Moscow district. Our wins included a revolution, two world wars, and decades of fear and misery. This allowed our team to recruit over 300 million human souls. I take pride in my work. Most of the time, I succeed. I love it. Just as I know you will too. There's nothing more fun than achieving complete destruction. Twenty years ago, our Lord and Master Lucifer promoted me to the Director of Recruitment Training. That's you. The next slide was of a question mark. The seven deadly sins were written over it. Many of you learned in your pre-infernal existence of the seven deadly sins. Lust, gluttony, greed, sloth, wrath, envy, and pride. You may be afraid that you must master each of the seven tools to make big recruitment bonuses. Well, that is false. Everything follows you if you exploit pride. Pride causes more misery and destruction than the rest put together. A student raised his hand. I answered their question. No. These techniques work anywhere on the planet. People are the same everywhere. I changed the slide to a picture of a man. This is Matthew Schoenberger. We ejected his last controller. Does anyone want to watch what happens after an ejection? It would spoil your lunch. I cherished the memories of his screams and pleas. My predecessor said that it was impossible to recruit Matt. He had money, prestige, power, knowledge, and access to sex. Let me show you how I proved him wrong. Lights, please. I played a video of a departmental meeting. This happened a week after I took the case. Matt was absolutely livid. 
He kept the plastic smile, but inside he wanted to kill the chief of staff. A patient had complained to the hospital about the number of tests Matt ran when they were screaming in pain. It turned out they had the flu, but Matt thought it was a gallbladder attack. Instead of Matt taking it as a lesson, I whispered to him justifications for his action. He had to be careful and uh, that he couldn't risk a malpractice suit. I told him what an utterly incompetent manager she was. How dare she deride him in front of everyone? She couldn't understand his feelings. Matt had seven months dry. My job was to chip away at the team effort that kept him clean and sober. That morning, I made sure Matt remembered that warm glow and the promise that the solution to his problems was in a wild turkey 101 bottle. I am the one who pushed Matt to anger. At first, I barely changed the chief of staff's remarks. As he justified himself, I twisted them more. I turned an illustration directed to the entire team into a deliberate insult. Then, as he worked the rest of the day, I carefully gave Matt thoughts. She's a lesbian. She hates men. It's not your fault. She wants to get rid of you because you're a man. She's jealous of how good you are. You'll show them. But the point I drove the hardest was... You're tired. You want to watch TV and go to bed. Construction slowed the freeway on Matt's commute home. I whispered in his ear to make them move by honking. You can see him tailgating the semi, pounding the horn and cursing. Did he change the behavior of the truck ahead of him? <laughs> of course not. The driver was a psychedelic relic with 500 watts of audio rocking the cab. He didn't know Matt was there and wouldn't have cared. Matt's anger achieved nothing, except bringing him closer to me. When he did get in, I kept him miserable by telling him that everyone should have seen who he was and let him in sooner. This is a key point. Never allow a human to be grateful. Always maintain the illusion that their actions cause everything. I went to a new slide. Now, let me show you two views of that highway. The first is a lie. It's how our prospects perceive it. Watch as we go from car to car. They think other people and the traffic are the only reasons they turn from calm to aggravated to irate. This is the truth. Every human on earth always has at least one demon with them. Many have several demons. How would they act if they knew their impulse for road rage might just be whisperings from us? We can only achieve victory as a team, helping each other in our common struggle. If you support each other in your efforts, then we will win. We have spent years making you believe you were special, the baddest or the saddest, the bravest or the lamest. We call this terminal uniqueness. Remember... That was our way of destroying you. I'll advance the video until the point where Matt made it home. Matt slumped in the dining room chair. A oh, lousy day, he told his wife, Ashley. His son Ian stood behind his mother, holding onto her leg. Is daddy sick again? No, Matt said. I'm just tired. Ashley glowered at him. Honest, completely clean. He smiled at Ian. I am fine. After dinner, he grabbed a bag of Cheetos and parked himself in front of the TV. I paused the video for a moment. Glass, you need to understand what I did next. I had 47 resentment tapes. They are memories of his past that make him angry or sad or ashamed. When I played them, his brain made him experience that pain again. Once he was in his chair and watching Dexter, I worked him hard. 
I began with mild ones and increased this discomfort until he pigged out on flaming hot Cheetos. <laughs> he wasn't even hungry, he'd just eaten dinner. But I trained him the same way humans train a dog. Every time I gave him anxiety or stress, he ate to stop it. This reinforced, the answer to problems in your head is consumption. <laughs> he thought he was using his own actions to control himself. Soon after, the video started again. Matt's cell phone vibrated. It was his AA sponsor. Matt, I missed you at the meeting tonight. How are you? Dwight. Matt typed. Horrible day at the hospital. Exhausted, going to sleep. I pointed to the screen. Hmm, see how Matt's pride works against him. He is exploding, but he's too proud to admit it to anyone, even himself. Instead, he clung to the idea he can handle everything by his own actions and willpower. I was getting stronger, and he didn't know it. He thought he was in control when he added two more addictions, food and TV. You may be wondering what I did to get Matt to drink. Actually, I was giving a lecture when he started. A student only three weeks out of this class scored. The screen showed a pool party. Here, we see a tiny but critical example of teamwork. Watch Matt's controller ask the controller of that voluptuous young woman to give Matt a bottle of beer. A simple act. It only took a moment. Yet its significance in Matt's destruction was pivotal. Matt's controller then told him that his months of not drinking proved he could drink safely and he deserved a drink to celebrate his self-control. Then his controller played the same escalation of resentment tapes I mentioned earlier. Matt consumed that cause light to drown the problems in his head as if it were Cheetos. And remember, all addictions are only a symptom of the problem misery, and pride. Our job is to convince him he can keep his ego and stop being miserable. The big screen showed Matt at home popping pills. Since alcohol didn't get him to hell soon enough, I had to up my game. Humans say our lord and master, Lucifer, is the father of lies. Well, it's a lie. I'm not saying I won't tell the prospect whoppers to reach them, but the truth is often far more damaging. I fed Matt diagnostic information about his patients. A few facts and a lot of flattery made him believe he was Dr. Gregory House. <laughs> Once he thought he was a miracle worker, I whispered a few falsehoods. So he diagnosed his hangover aches and pains as serious illnesses. As bizarre as it may seem, his ego will do anything to defend his using. Before long, Matt and another doctor were swapping prescriptions for Ritalin, Oxycodone, Xanax, Benzos, and a host of other destructive medications. He became even more anxious and depressed. He also began suffering from nightmares. Naturally, he took more drugs to treat the symptoms of his drugs. I put up a slide that read, Self-Destruction. Matt's overinflated ego told him he is in control. We helped him to keep that illusion. We sold him something to cure the problems in his head, and the ones created by his pride. Humans do more than just pills to support their delusions. They lie, threaten, Beg, kill, make deals and butter up with kindness so they can get other people to do what they want. Eventually, their power over others and themselves will fail. With Matt, it took a year. By then, Ashley had found his drugs hidden in the garage, got a restraining order against him, and filed for divorce. I stood, smiling. Four months later, we achieved total victory. After a three-day methamphetamine and pcp fuel binge with a ten-dollar beauty queen he'd met at Walmart, I convinced Matt that he needed to spend quality time with his son. So he picked Ian up and drove off with him. Since the court had given his wife sole custody, 
and there was a restraining order against him. According to the law, Matt had kidnapped him. Oh, but the story only gets better. I grinned. I had never had so much fun. Here Matt is, driving Ian and me away. I told Matt that he needed to go faster. Go faster, go faster. And he did. Watch that family walking in the crosswalk as Matt ran the red light doing 73 in a 40 zone. Oh, I have to give a shout out to thank the great teamwork by the former controllers of Mother and Father. They delayed everyone long enough for Matt to score a perfect hit. Whee! Baby grease spots as Matt ran over the kids. The Suburban's impact crushed Dad's chest and smashed his skull against the road. But the best part was Mama. The accident rammed her head through the windshield of Matt's Suburban. Kept getting better from there. Matt fled the scene with Mum on the hood. A TV station helicopter broadcast this view live. That's her flapping away in the breeze as we flew at over 110 miles an hour. Oh, observe how her neck snapped and her decapitated body crumpled onto the freeway. What they didn't show the home audience was the fun we had with her head bouncing around inside the vehicle. The screen shows the roadblocks. The local Flatfoots tried to spoil the entertainment, with spike strips across the highway. But I wasn't going to let them stop the party so quickly. There, Matt punched one officer and bit a second. They hammered on him with their nightsticks, but he was so high he didn't even notice. They had to taser him three times. At that point... Matt was facing everything from five counts of vehicular manslaughter to extreme, aggravated DUI with a minor in the vehicle. Here we see Matt waking up in jail, bruised, battered, and with no idea how he got there. He knew it wasn't good, though. And this is Matt handcuffed to the table in an interrogation room. They're showing him the photo radar pictures of his suburban hitting that family. <gasps> Look at the expression on his face. Shock, disbelief, and self-loathing. It only gets better when he watches the TV footage and video of the arrest. Oh, we have yet one more act in Matt's drama. I beamed with pride as I advanced the scene five days. It showed Matt hanging himself using a rope made from his sheets. Ah, before we break out into individual training modules... I had to show you how we achieved total victory last night. Not only that, but we have wonderful prospects with Ian and Ashley. Ian now has major PTSD, while Ashley is depressed, resentful and bitter. Hmm, we should be seeing both of them here soon. <sighs> I love making recruits. This is my work and my glory. To bring about the destruction and eternal damnation of man. When's Miracle Girl coming? I asked, and got a stony look of disapproval from my uncle in return. If he read comic books, he'd appreciate my nickname for an immortal elementary schooler. Grandpa laid his good grey eye on me. The filmy, unseeing one wandered off, like the old man's mind often did. <laughs> Miracle, my... Dad! Uncle Isaac snapped, the confines of our apartment's small kitchen lending an extra edge to his voice. I bit my lip to keep from laughing. Did Uncle Isaac really think a 7th grader wouldn't know what Grandpa was trying to say? I folded my arms atop the headrest of Grandpa's wheelchair and leaned forward with the wheel safely locked in place. Don't take that tone with me, soldier, Grandpa wheezed, which led to a fit of coughing. I sprung up, rushed a cup of water to him and took away the yoghurt. Grandpa raised the cup to his cracked lips. It shook spilling some water onto the rusty metal box he'd been using for a tray. Uncle Isaac let out a long sigh. 
<sighs> I'm not a soldier, Dad. I'm a rabbi. My father was the soldier, but he died when I was a baby. If you want to go to rabbinical school instead of the Marines, well, I guess you have my blessing, Grandpa said, his voice training off. A giggle escaped from my lips. I took away the empty cup and gave Grandpa his yogurt back. I'm glad you find your grandfather's Alzheimer's funny, Daniel, Uncle Isaac muttered. Guilt melted the smile from my face. My mind's as clear as ever, Grandpa protested, finishing the last spoonful and wiping his mouth with his bathrobe sleeve. Now he smelled of blueberry Danon and old man. So, when's she coming? I asked again. Not that I particularly cared. Uncle Isaac checked his watch. In about 15 minutes. And her name is Eve. Eve Roth. That was her name, Grandpa said, as if it had been changed. He raised the yogurt container upside down with a spoon and shook it a little. Corporal Weiss was my miracle. The Germans took him from us when they put a bullet in his gut. Then we thought... God, he spat out the word like phlegm caught in his throat. God had given him back. That was 75 years ago, Dad. The effort to keep his voice calm reddened my uncle's bearded face. Your memory isn't... Hey, what's that in your lap? Oh, I gave that box to Grandpa. I gestured to the worn metal container. Shaped like a shoebox, but flatter, not quite as long. Only flecks remained of the olive green paint that once coated it. A pair of rusty latches held it closed. Yeah, he um asked me to get it for him from the attic. It's um, old medals and stuff. At least, that's what Grandpa had told me. I'd never seen the box before. Having to dig it out from under a big pile of junk. It was too heavy to be holding a bunch of medals. One big thing slid around inside. I was curious, but I didn't want to be nosy. If Grandpa wanted me to see what was in there, he'd show me soon enough. Grandpa tapped the box with a quivering, gnarled finger. These are Vice's personal effects. He had no next of kin, so I took him. Grandpa sounded sad. Like this man, Vice had just died yesterday, not a lifetime ago. Uncle Isaac's face scrunched. Why would you want to look at those things now? Grandpa's good eye stared past my uncle, fixed on something I couldn't see. Our rifles had been fired, of course. Vice smelled the gunpowder and thought we were his killers. Uncle Isaac rolled his eyes. <sighs> no ghost stories, Dad. Please, not now. No, not a ghost. Not vice. The vengeful spirit inside him. God knows why Dibbuks choose who they choose. But they only possess our people. You're training to be a rabbi. You ought to know about them. Dad, I finished my rabbinical training 30 years ago. Dibbuks weren't in the curriculum. Um, what's a dibbuk? I asked. Grandpa never mentioned them in any of his musty stories of deadly German snipers and unstoppable tiger tanks. Uncle Isaac waved his hand as if to brush away the subject. Oh, a bogeyman from Jewish folklore, and a figment of your grandfather's imagination. Grandpa didn't hear Uncle Isaac, or pretended not to. Mm, Vice ripped out the medic's throat with his teeth. Daniel doesn't need to hear this, Dad, Uncle Isaac said, hands on his hips and shaking his head in disapproval. Oh, a Jewish zombie. Cool. Complete Alzheimer's fuel crap, but cool. Uncle Isaac never told me to shut up, in words anyway. His glare did that. Daniel, take Grandpa to his room and put on the game for him. Grandpa's eyes narrowed. No, I want to see the girl. Uncle Isaac rubbed his temples with his thumb and forefinger. Dad, 
Her family just suffered a major trauma. You probably don't remember the shooting that was on the news. I remember the mall shooting, Grandpa said with surprising certainty. Well, the roughs were trapped inside the mall when it happened. Eve took a bullet to the chest. I know. I heard you talking on the phone this morning. I'm not deaf yet, you know. The girl was declared dead, but now she's up and about. Grandpa pointed an accusing finger at Uncle Isaac. Hmm. You really believe the doctors pulled off a miracle? Yeah, Dad. I do. Uncle Isaac briefly removed his black yarmulke to scratch his head. But healing the body is one thing. The mind is something else. Eve hasn't spoken a word since she regained consciousness. She was released from the hospital Tuesday. The roughs are coming for a counseling session to see if I can break Eve out of her shell. You know better than anyone that overcoming trauma isn't that... Grandpa interrupted. Hmm. The medic declared Vice dead. The first time. Uncle Isaac's face reddened. I knew he wanted to yell, but a forced calm emerged. Dad, just don't. Don't compare your friend to this little girl. Vice obviously wasn't dead. The medic was tired. You were all impossibly tired. Vice was just unconscious and woke up shell-shocked, not possessed by a dibbuck. You should have seen his eyes, Grandpa whispered. More to himself than to me and my uncle. They were wrong. Daniel, take your grandfather. It's Vice. He's still coming, Grandpa shrieked. He sent the yogurt container flying when he pointed with his spoon at an ordinary cabinet filled with plates and dishes. His eyes bulged like they'd popped from their sockets, and the color drained from his face. Terror contorted his expression into that of a vampire who'd seen the sunrise. Keep firing at him. My heart pounded hard enough to hurt my chest. G Grandpa, there's nothing there. A little boy's voice inside my head screamed for me to hightail it from the kitchen. I was six and ran away the first time I witnessed one of Grandpa's flashbacks. Thirteen now. I stood my ground like a good soldier. Uncle Isaac crouched in front of the wheelchair and met Grandpa's gaze. Dad, no one's coming. You're home. You're safe. The pink crept back into Grandpa's flesh. Isaac, he panted. Yes, Dad, it's me. Is Vice down? Uncle Isaac nodded. Yes, he's down. Grandpa's shoulders slumped. A strange mix of sorrow and relief softened his wrinkled features. He's been gone a long time. You were remembering the war. Let Daniel help you into bed so you can get some rest. Uncle Isaac moved out of the way and gave me a nod. I took a deep breath and released it slowly before unlocking the wheels of Grandpa's chair and pushing him towards the living room. But with speed and strength I never imagined Grandpa possessed. He jammed his yogurt spoon into the wheelchair's gears where it stuck. I'm staying. I kneeled beside the chair and struggled to pull the spoon out, but the handle kept sliding from my grip. How did a man, not much more than skin and bones, get it in so good? Hoping the wheel spokes would force the spoon out or break it, I tried to push Grandpa forward. But the chair wouldn't budge. I, the chair stuck, Uncle Isaac. Damn it, Dad. Uncle Isaac stooped down and tried to get the spoon loose. Frustration wrinkled his brow as his efforts amounted to nothing. Grandpa couldn't walk by himself. Even if we could convince him going to bed was a good idea. Uncle Isaac, with his bad back and scrawny me, well, we couldn't carry him. Uncle Isaac groaned grasping his lower back as he slowly rose to his feet. Daniel, get me the toolbox from the closet. The doorbell rang. Uncle Isaac glanced at his watch and then shrugged in resignation. God, they would be early. Forget the toolbox. He looked to Grandpa. Dad, 
Can you at least stay quiet and not scare Eve with your crazy stories? Can we agree? <laughs> the child's been through enough. I bet my uncle wished there was a door between the kitchen and the living room. But there was no shutting Grandpa in. Grandpa nodded slowly, his thin lips pursed. Stay here with him, Uncle Isaac said to me. Keep him calm. I'm going to take the Roths into my study. Okay. Like I had control over Grandpa's flashbacks. I took a seat at the table, pulled out my phone, and started playing a first-person shooter. Uncle Isaac frowned. Put that away and talk to your grandfather. I looked up at Grandpa. He seemed miles from here, fighting the last battles of World War II in his head. There was no talking to him now. The doorbell rang again. Uncle Isaac walked into the living room, adjusting his yarmulke so it neatly covered his bald spot before answering the front door and beckoning the family in. Shalom, Mr. and Mrs. Roth. He looked down at Eve, who I couldn't see behind her parents. A weary-eyed couple dressed conservatively. Eve's mom wore a head covering and a long skirt, though it was June, and her dad was in a black suit with a plain yarmulke atop his head. Uncle Isaac bent over and offered Eve his hand, which she didn't take. And shalom to you, Eve, he said, undaunted. I hear you are a very brave girl. Daniel, Grandpa whispered. Turn me so I can see them. I'll try, Grandpa but it'd be easier if you hadn't messed up the chair. He snickered softly. I put down my phone, stood, and grabbed the chair's handles. Scraping the wheels on the floor, I managed to swivel him so he faced the family. They didn't take notice of us, or pretended not to. Eve hid behind her mum and dad as Uncle Isaac spoke. Her parents' smiles were perfectly wide, as if they'd been painted on. A sudden chill caused my skin to break out in goosebumps, and I wrapped my arms around my chest. Please follow me. Uncle Isaac led the trio towards his study. Before they disappeared down the hall, I glimpsed Miracle Girl. I'd never pick her out from a crowd of ten-year-olds as the one who got shot, died, and was brought back to life, but any scars and bandages were hidden behind her red dress. Grandpa fiddled with the latches on his box. They clicked, and the lid opened a crack. I felt eyes on me, and found Eve, alone, at the living room entrance. She faced us like an expressionless mannequin, or someone asleep with eyes wide open. Dead, dark eyes that turned my blood to ice. It was as if her gaze met mine by weird accident. A blindfolded kid pinning the tail on the donkey the first try. I managed a timid wave. Uh, hi Eve. No answer. No sign she'd heard me. Mrs. Roth came to stand beside her daughter. Mr. Roth and Uncle Isaac were a step behind. Eve? What is it, honey? Mrs. Roth cooed, studying Grandpa and me to see what her daughter found so interesting. Eve lifted her head and sniffed the air like a dog. Uncle Isaac's brow furrowed at Eve's behavior, but he calmly introduced us. That's my nephew, Daniel, and my dad, his Grandpa Morris. The hinges squeaked as Grandpa pulled back the lid. You smell it, don't you, girl? The gunpowder. He lifted from the box a large, old-fashioned gun with a long barrel and angular grip. My jaw dropped. Dad, is that... is that thing loaded? Uncle Isaac's words rode a tsunami of disbelief. Put it away now! Eve walked towards Grandpa drawing air through her nose between each slow, deliberate step. Grandpa leveled the gun at the little girl, two fingers on the trigger. 
the empty box slid off his lap and clattered on the floor. It's not the weapon that killed her, but she don't know that. Dibbox ain't that discerning. Eve! Mr. Roth took her sleeve and yanked her backwards, putting his body between his daughter and the line of fire. In a blur of movement, Eve had a two-handed hold of his arm, which she twisted until it made a sickening crack. Mr. Roth was still crying out in pain when she effortlessly tossed him across the room like a toy discarded by a tantruming toddler. The wall shook when he hit it, and the back of his head painted a red streak as he slid to the carpet in a lifeless heap. Mrs. Roth's scream drowned out my own. With eyes a manga artist couldn't draw any wider, Uncle Isaac stood still as a statue, mouth agape. I also didn't move. None of this could possibly be real, though it was at the wrong time of the year for a sick Halloween hoax. Mrs. Roth then ran to her husband and knelt before him, not noticing Eve stalking her. Eve jumped onto her back and swung her arms around Mrs. Roth's neck. Her teeth sank into her mother's throat. Blood gushed from the woman's neck in a scarlet geezer. Daniel, get behind me, Grandpa barked. I listened without thinking and cowered behind the wheelchair. Two bangs shattered my eardrums. Then I heard nothing but a low hum. God had clicked mute on the world. A window flew outward in a fountain of silently breaking glass. Eve opened her bloody mouth, releasing Mrs. Roth. The entangled bodies of mother and child fell over, but only Eve moved, a ravenous leopard rising on all fours. The other bullet had torn a hole in Eve's shoulder, but it didn't stop her from pouncing on Grandpa. The gun dropped to the kitchen floor. I backed away until up against the countertop. Deafness spared me Grandpa's cries as Eve bit into his throat. Sounds I didn't even dare imagine. Uncle Isaac came to his senses, grabbed the small girl's arms and tried to pull her off Grandpa. The drone in my ears subsided in time for me to hear my uncle grunting with the effort but she wouldn't surrender her prey. He changed tactics, swinging a fist at her head and smashing her ear. Eve paid him no mind. Sirens. Someone had reported the gunshots. The faint sound grew steadily louder, but the cops wouldn't get here soon enough. Forcing my eyes from the carnage, my gaze fell upon the gun at Grandpa's feet. I dove to the floor and crawled on my belly until close enough to reach under the wheelchair, grab the gun's grip, and slide the weapon towards me. I sprung to my feet behind Grandpa's chair, the heavy weapon in both hands. Three of my skinny fingers fit around the trigger. I tried to center the notch at the end of the barrel on Eve, but my trembling hand made it nearly impossible. Maybe I'd hit her, Maybe Grandpa or Uncle Isaac, who was still swinging away at her head. I couldn't. My frightened fingers made the choice for me. The automatic weapon fired four rounds with an accidental squeeze of the trigger. At such close range, the bullets pierced the wheelchair's fabric back and Grandpa's frail frame. Eve slumped onto Grandpa's lap and then rolled onto the floor, face down, blood pooling beneath her. Her body twitched a few times before it stilled. In that same moment, Uncle Isaac keeled over, bleeding torrentially from his abdomen. I dropped the gun and fell to my knees, my body racked with sobs. Sensing movement, I lifted my eyes and wiped the wet from them, Grandpa had risen from his wheelchair. He walked towards me, expressionless, 
blood poured from his neck and the holes in his chest. Did Eve kill him, or was it the gunshots? He sniffed the air, and then his good eye worked its way up from the weapon at my knees to meet my horrified stare. It didn't matter, I realised. Dibbuks weren't that discerning. Well, another fantastic couple of stories there from you. Um, you know, I know you like the uh, longer vids, so I found a couple of stories I really like from the vault, and I put them both together, and um, really thought those were great stories. Hope you agreed, so tell me your thoughts in the comments section below, and um, I'll try and join in the chit-chat. So, if you did like them, then uh, at the end of this video, you'll see a couple of suggestions pop up on the screen, so maybe there's something that you haven't seen yet. Well, enough for one night. I, of course, will be back again on Wednesday. I do so hope you'll join me again. Until then, sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook, come chat with me on Twitter, listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud, drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt, and, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so... Come check me out, okay?